You're listening to Arizona Good Business Radio, featuring unique stories with leaders who believe the community is a central part of doing business. Join us on the journeys of entrepreneurs, local businesses, and champions of Arizona who believe working together, we can build stronger communities. Welcome to Arizona Good Business Radio. We feature leaders in the Arizona business community working to build a lasting impact throughout our state through doing good business. I'm your host, Thomas Barr, Vice President of Business Development at Local First Arizona. If you don't know us, we're a statewide organization advocating for and celebrating locally owned businesses, and we're the largest local business coalition in North America. Crazy. We provide resources to thousands of small businesses while raising awareness of the benefits of building a strong local economy. I am super excited to be here today with three people, which we never do in the studio. We're packed house today. Uh, Kale, the Director of Sales and the current president of the Arizona Craft Brewers Guild, but he's Director of Sales at Oso Brewery. Andrew, the Deputy Director of the Arizona Craft Brewers Guild. And Brad, the Head of Production at Arizona Wilderness <laughs> Brewing Company. As you can tell, we're going to talk about beer today. <laughs> Welcome <laughs> to the show, guys. Thanks we for can it. talk about Thank other you. things, too. <laughs> <laughs> what do, you want, do you want to talk about coffee or something? <laughs> we can. We're people, too, you know. <laughs> Getting into the weeds about coffee, yeah. <laughs> well, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, super excited to be here. Gosh, we've had such a long history at Local First with the brewery community. I mean, I've been doing this work for almost 11 years, and I can't remember a time when we weren't partners with the Craft Brewers Guild, that we weren't working with AZ Wilderness, that... We weren't doing things with Oso Brewery, now Distillery, all of the great things. And things have changed a lot in at least my 11 years. I know in the last 20 years in the brewery industry in Arizona. Andrew, I kind of want to start with you, but would love everybody's take. Where are we at today? <laughs> <laughs> Where are we at with beer in yeah. Arizona? We are, people ask it, oh, is beer sales going down? Is, is everyone not drinking? Are they going to spirits and wine? And all of that is true. Mm. Arizona breweries' production levels are pretty level across the last few years. We feel like alcohol consumption stays pretty steady in America <laughs> as a standard. Of when times are good, people drink. Two when times point, are bad, yeah, people bad. drink. Yeah. 2.1 <laughs> gallons of yeah. ethanol for yeah. each adult American every year, like since the 50s. Wow. So drinking isn't really changing that much. Uh, their uh, non-alcoholic beer is a pretty hot topic right now. And it's kind of been found that people who are drinking al- non-alcoholic beer are doing both. Mm. So they're using it as like maybe a little slowdown. You don't see people getting into adulthood and saying, I'm going to start drinking all the non-alcoholic beers. Mm-hmm. It's people who are already part of the community and are finding another, either another occasion or just, hey, in the middle, I'm just going to have one of our NA IPAs. Yeah, Arizona. Specific, specifically what we see a lot with our with our NA is the designated driver or whatever. They have one sure. beer and then they'll switch to an NA when everyone else keeps drinking. So Right. Yeah. We've had six breweries open in Arizona in the last two and a half months. Oh, wow. So the Arizona beer industry is really growing slowly and measured. We are 43rd in the nation for breweries per capita. Mm. There's a lot of space for Arizona to grow. We definitely punch above that level with some of our breweries' community involvement and with uh, the variety of breweries that we have. So we've got breweries, a brand new one opened in Bisbee, another one opened in Sholo and Wickenburg. Mm -hmm. So we're reaching new communities, but we're also growing out in the communities we already serve, such as Pinnacle and Scottsdale and slow body in Tucson. So we really have a lot of choices for the consumer and that just makes for a really healthy business community and people working together. Yeah. And even though our per capita ranking is in the forties, I feel like we could look directly at Oso's model and wilderness's model of, you know, you've got more than one location. Um, you've expanded in intentional ways. You're very community driven sort of a thing. So Kale and Brad, can you tell us a little bit about I guess the intentions that both of your breweries have had in uh, both navigating the landscape of maybe changes in how people have been drinking or, or consuming uh, beer products, but also like how your companies have grown. Um, You've really picked out spaces that were really intentional for you. So Kale, maybe we start with you. Yeah, we're up to like 
47 locations now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's We're kind of around 10, I think, actually. Oh, it's um, that many? Okay. Well, with two airport locations, I kind of count them. They I count? Mean, it's an outlet. Yeah. Heck yeah. Yeah. I count 13. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's being, you know, spread across the valley. Like, every little community is different. And mm-hmm. it's, you know... Um, Arizona is unique, I think, in a way where the way we're set up, where people think, you know, like Phoenix, and it just kind of spreads out from this main, you know, hub where, you know, you go to other states and it's a little more spread out. But being that Phoenix is just you know, vastly different than Tempe, than Gilbert, than Chandler. So everywhere we kind of spread our wings, like we do a pretty substantial job before we even open to like entrench ourselves in what that community and culture is um most recent we just opened up in um central and like dunlap in the sunny slope area oh cool and those people are super proud there's like an old rich tradition down there the slope yeah man i mean <laughs> i live over there so i'm all about it you know um but it's you know just hearing the neighbors and all this and, and the passion they have it's just different than gilbert you know yeah. gilbert downtown gilbert is kind of like a you know old town scottsdale kind of vibe and people go but there's, don't tell don't tell them that. <laughs> nah, well, it's a lot more it's a lot more family friendly yeah. that way, which is where we need to be, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, you know, just kind of, you know, taking those measures, listening to the neighbors, listening to the community yeah. um before we open, like we do, you know, a little research in the community before we decide where we want to maybe expand. Yeah. Um and that to us is a big benefit. You know, during COVID, it just really emphasized the only reason I think that we did as well, or at least got by the way we did is just our fanfare, our, you know, our, our consumers were just like, I don't know what would happen if Osa wasn't here at the end of this, you know? Mm -hmm. And it it really got loud with that. And people were so supportive. And that's just because of everything we put into our community, our neighboring schools, our neighboring shelters, or, you know, what have you, you know, we're really big on that, but every little community has something different, which is great. And I hear it all. So the more we spread, the more yeah. I get to see what cool things people are doing, actually. Yeah. And Brad, obviously, Wilderness started in Gilbert. Um, mm-hmm. Huge growth coming to downtown Phoenix, and that's like a staple of, of yeah. the Roosevelt Row community now. And congrats on the yeah. announcement of the McDowell Road expansion. I guess I answer the same question. How has Wilderness approached it as well? Yeah. Yeah, I think they started it out as just trying to be like an extension of Arizona wilderness and it is, but mm. they're two completely different places. The, mm. the beer splits on like what we sell more of is vastly different. Really? Um, La Ciudad was brewed for downtown. So it's like La Ciudad and loggers down there. Mm. Um, Gilbert, it's refuge IPA and kind of more of the, the older school craft beer drinkers. Okay. Um, and we have our Woodnote cellar too, um, which is just like a half mile from the Gilbert spot. And that's where we act. That's where we do all our mixed culture beer and uh, different. It's like a barrel vibe there, yeah. um, winery vibe. So, cool. Yeah. Right on. And um, you've both been in um, also production of retail for some time now. Um, what is, how is that different from operating the breweries day to day? I don't run any of the, the retail, um, but it, it's, we try to be intentional with all of that stuff to so make it fit on brand. It's not a huge part of what we do. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, the things that do well, like specific shirts, we're always surprised. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to the ones like, oh, why isn't everyone buying this one? Oh, everyone loved that one. Yeah. So, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, Andrew, we were talking a little bit before about um, how when I had first, I think, started a partnership with AZ Craft Brewers, I don't know, and it wasn't our first partnership, but we had a relationship I don't know, seven, eight years ago, and we were working with like... 50, 53 breweries, something like that. Right. You let me know that's over 100 now, right? Yes. So how many how many breweries, microbreweries, or, or how do we define it in Arizona, and how many is the Craft Brewers Guild working with now? Yeah, it is uh, It is a tough to define because do you call Oso or Wilderness one brewery, or do you call them 13? So mm. we have 109 brewing companies. Okay. We've got over 170 locations that you can find branded, with those breweries' names where they're serving their beer. Cool. Some of them have food, some of them don't. When there were 50 breweries, man, um, it was a whole different thing. But also, those breweries are the ones that are producing the most now. And the ones that have opened since are definitely more local 
we serve our neighborhood. You're often yeah. finding the, the owners bartending yeah. or brewing or both, and some in the morning and some at night. I mean, our members, more than 75%, produce less than 2,000 barrels, which is not a lot of beer. Mm. And 50% produce less than 1,000 barrels. So if you compare that with uh, Santana at 40,000 and Huss at 28, 29,000, you can see the difference between the distribution breweries and what their model is compared to the smaller breweries. And the smaller breweries now have packaging because they want to sell beer to go at their location during COVID. Coming in and filling up growlers really just didn't cut it anymore. Mm. You could do some, but people want to come in, grab a case of beer and just leave. Mm-hmm. So getting more of our breweries into packaging was a huge part of what happened to the industry over COVID. Mm. Before that, there was maybe seven or eight that did legit packaging, and now oh, wow. half at least. Oh, crazy. A lot of the um, the canning line manufacturers kind of made it easier and cheaper for smaller breweries to bring in a canning line and do it themselves. There was the mobile packaging thing. Mobile West was the big one in Arizona for a while. Mm. Um, but now mostly, like, it's cheaper and more effective to buy a tiny little gosling canning line that's that's what we have so gotcha. <laughs> and there's yeah. a local uh canning line manufacturer i mean cano that's one of our allied members but they have probably 15 or 20 canning lines throughout the state okay and they go you know international even so availability of those lines is something because pre-pandemic you would wait six months or more to get a canning line they didn't just have them sitting around they were all Mm -hmm. custom built Mm -hmm. it's a more industrial situation now they've simplified the lines and they just made it easier to do so yeah Yeah, for sure well to go back a little bit on you know what it's kind of a business model really is you know i mean you have pre-prohibition and you know people were making their own juice here and there and you know, like if you had a car, that was luxury life, right? So people were stuck to their little neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden you couldn't do that. And the ones that survived are, you know, your big conglomerates. But now you see there's a new brewery opened up in Heber. That's probably the only one they need. It's small. <laughs> but it's like you just have your your little local brewery. They're not set up to do this huge distribution. They don't really care to do that huge distribution thing. Yeah, there, there are their own nightmares with being in a distribution but at the same time, you know, it's just, you know, you kind of pick your lane and stick to it. Um, sure. So to see little breweries open up around the valley to service their little neighborhood is super rad. You know? Yeah. 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 And rural, small rural Arizona is obviously very different, right? Like <laughs> they they can only do so much. I remember I was talking to a guy one time. I forget which town he was in. He He owned like a yarn company and we were trying to help him like grow his business or whatever. And we were giving him all these ideas and stuff. And he sat back and he was just like, yeah, but then I'd run out of yarn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. I was like, all right, we're, that needs we're to just- be a t-shirt. I think that would be so awesome. <laughs> but then I'd run out of yarn. <laughs> what would I do then? <laughs> no. So what, one of the things I love about the beer community and you all probably love too, is just like, that that there is just like it's community right i remember years ago it was maybe seven years ago or so before uh i think ren house started to really make a name for themselves it was kind of this like you had to kind kind of know it was there or you were like flying by on on the road i still do yeah uh, <laughs> it's just like, like oh turn around oh, that, that was back. it you know like and so occasionally i would like have like a happy hour with somebody there and be like oh let me show you this space maybe never heard of it and we went there one time. It was like a four o'clock, four thirty meeting on like a Thursday or something. I forget. And we walked in, and all of you, you guys are having a meeting, like <laughs> you're like mm-hmm. quarterly or monthly, like get together of all the breweries. And I was like, okay, I guess this place got popular. But like <laughs> we realized in the moment, like it was like your get together, or whatever. Mm-hmm. How do you guys still do those? Like how often? Like how connected? Or is there like a group text? Like. <laughs> Like, how does it all work? There yeah. is. Yeah. So yeah. our uh, there is. <laughs> we we have a board of nine board of directors, and there's a lot of communication on that. We're mm. we're talking with our board of directors uh, daily, pretty much. There's a lot to do. I mean, there are existential threats. There are literal threats to people wanting to change the way that breweries can sell their their product, and then there's uh, the new 
types of things that breweries can make. So seltzers, is that a beer? Is it not a beer? Can breweries make it? Can they not? We have mm. to figure all that stuff out. And in the most, uh, most legalized <laughs> business in the world, uh, we have to make sure that we're protecting our members from problems that might come up just from putting the wrong stuff in a beer. Yeah. So we did change the, uh, the definition of beer in Arizona statutes because if you put beer in a barrel and there's already whiskey in that barrel, you're fortifying beer and that's illegal. Mm. So even if you dump any liquid out, there's still spirit in there and there could be an argument made that you're fortifying the beer. So we have to change the law to say beer that is stored or fermented or treated in a barrel is still beer. Mm. And uh, yeah. there are little things like that all the time. Mm. Yeah, it's there. You know, I don't want to say we're like always under attack, but it's always preservation mm. on what we have and looking into the future on what we could have. And, you know, having that option and being able to pivot with a culture that is continuously pivoting is very important. Um, and so, you know, the guild uh, provides a lot of benefit to, uh, you know, those things where, you know, they're sitting with, you know, lobbyists and all that just to, again, maintain or see what might be coming around to, you know, help or either hinder our industry. Um, you know, there was a lot of um, cases during COVID where some of these breweries were just shut down and they couldn't do anything. Mm. Um, you know, Nevada was one and they're like, we just can't do anything right now. Wow. But our guild came to bat and was like, no, beer is essential and kept us open, able to, um, you know, get by that. And those are things that, you know, some people don't really understand, you know, when it comes to, you know, are you part of a union or whatever? There are some benefits, obviously. Um, but when you look deeper into it, you'll see that there's a lot more things that um, is deeper than on the surface. And so for that, um, just the unity being behind the guild for everybody, whether you're in Heber or Yuma, you know, you're not necessarily here at the Capitol trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah. It's statewide. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of, um, you know, at bats on their behalf. So that's pretty rad. Got it. More like superficial stuff with the guild, all these mixers and stuff that we do, like you create relationships and you network um, and like simpler things like, oh, I, I don't have any dextrose right now. I need to, I need some corn sugar from somebody. Mm. Call Gully from 12 West. He, he's like, oh yeah, I got a bag. So it kind of fosters those relationships as well. Yeah. That's cool. And I had someone call me on saturday morning and said i'm doing a canning run today and i'm 100 lids short for my cans yeah do you know anyone that can get me some <laughs> on saturday morning this is uh 9 30 yeah. and he said we're gonna start canning at 11 and we got some lids there so you know yeah. it's it's other breweries working with them saying like i just catch me back up whenever you can right yeah and we're all neighbors you need some yeah. sugar here's some sugar you know yeah. I mean? right. like, <laughs> exactly you need some oats all right fine yeah, yeah. <laughs> So a common conversation that we have all the time, and I'm just expanding it out, the restaurant industry, the food and dining space uh, has been and, and continues to be a difficult space to operate in. You've got staff retention and hiring challenges, cost doing business challenges, shrinking that down into the brewery industry. What does that look like for all of you? Is that is it just as hard to run a brewery as it is to run a brew pub? Um, like what are all, wh what comes into that and what's at play right now for operating, you know, 13 lo or 11 location. I forget what number we landed on. <laughs> um, <me too. laughs> Wilderness expanding to another location. Like how are, do you find that being a locally owned brewery, like sets you apart and differentiates you just from the hospitality industry in general, or like, do you struggle with the same challenges that the industry does in general? No, I think we're, we're dealing with some of those challenges right now. Um, when, Money gets tight with people, inflation hits, they keep drinking beer, they just might not go get a luxury IPA at a craft mm -hmm. brewery. Mm -hmm. um, so we're kind of, we're dealing with that, like right now, um, it's tough. Um, people aren't going out as much anymore, so you, we gotta, you gotta find ways to incentivize people to come in, holding events, um, doing discount deals, whatever you have to do to bring those people back. Yeah, so. it's, you know, you kind of mentioned Rent House before, you know, I mean, there's a lot of times I kind of sometimes maybe daydream about like, oh, that must be easy, you know, just <laughs> just to serve beer. Um, having a restaurant and a brewery has its own challenges because the restaurant is, it, we kind of separate it a lot. There's, mm. we call it production, you know, for the brewery side. And then you have the restaurant side, like any other restaurant. Um, 
while the restaurant carries its own challenges. You know, the breweries for us is not so bad. Um, we don't really have turnover, really. I mean, do you have ever had? Yeah, turnover? when you, like, when I you, don't know anyone that's left. Oh, so yeah, brilliant. when you, you know, I, I like to say, you know, you treat your people well, there's no reason for them to leave. Um, but also, I mean, just, you know, brewing beer and there's not really anyone breathing down your neck because not everyone could do this a little more specialized in a way. Yeah. Um, so getting into that world is, you know, like, well, you could get somebody else to do it and that's fine. There are some people who are eager to do it, but knowledge is power. So, you know, a lot of our breweries are very smart. We put a lot into education. We allow them to go continual growth. We just had a brewer went to Chicago for two weeks just to learn about, you know, wow. further learn about IPAs. Cool. Um, and then he brings that back, shares with the team, stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, on the beer side, a lot different. I think our biggest turnover is like our delivery driver, which I don't blame them at all because <laughs> slinging around 50 half barrel kegs a day is, you know. And that's, I mean, just <clears throat> the delivery uh, industry in general is changing a ton too in its infrastructure. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Man, no turnover at all. Uh like on, like there's one <laughs> no honestly we promote within <laughs> that's wild yeah that's cool. yeah we promote within um and then people choose to leave like i don't think yeah. we've really fired a brewer yeah. which and i don't even know if anyone leaves do they yeah <laughs> i mean i, I know mean, all i have these guys yeah. and they're all still there it's, it's been like 12 I years i think for me. my yeah. cousin still works at the pv location zach benitez <laughs> so she... have you seen zach and i throw beer no oh <laughs> we have he used to be my bar back okay yeah well he started a bar back that was a bartender but he was my original bar back but we have this this trick where you know i'll pour beer on one side of the bar and i'll flip it to him you know i get a little coaster and it'll it'll flip and rotate. I can show you the video later. <laughs> and that's me and Zach. We still got it. Like I just did it the other week after years. Like somebody's were like, "No way you could do that." I'm like, "Zach, you want to try?" He's like, "Yeah, sure." But uh, I also gave him a little PTSD because I would whistle. <laughs> so I'd bartend, and he'd you know bar back, clean up stuff. But I would whistle, and if I was done with my cup, I would just like I like, and I would throw it. And I, like, that's all I would do. But he knew to turn around because something was coming. <laughs> and so he'd always turn around and catch something. Yeah. And, and I always, we had a very good chemistry. But so <laughs> we that. were joking before we started <clears throat> that when we go to do media, when you get a call from media to do like a TV segment or something, you've got like no time. It's like 60 seconds. And I recently saw Zach's dad, my uncle, Tia Juan, and he was just like, Dude, next time you go on TV, you got to shout me out. So, <laughs> Tijuana, this is this is it. Like, I, I'm not going to do it on live TV, but this is your shout out. There so, you go. So there you go. Covered. Check. <laughs> <laughs> well, back to the industry in general, Andrew. Where are we headed? What are the big issues at hand or challenges and or um, do you expect – six more breweries in the next two and a half months. Like, are we going to keep building and growing? Do you see it plateauing? Like where is the industry going in Arizona in general? Right now, there are a lot of breweries that are hitting that seven to 10 year age where leases are coming up and people have life changes in 10 years. And if you're a small neighborhood brewery and you've been absolutely like hammering for 10 years, maybe you're tired. Maybe you've got some kids that are three or four years old and you're like, I got to step back. My lease is coming up. They're tripling the rent. What am I going to do? Maybe it's time for me to call this off. Mm. We do expect to see some closings. I don't have any like eminent, but that's always something that's coming up, especially at this cycle of age of businesses yeah. in our industry. I have at least three more that are going to open this year. Okay. I don't think that we're going to see that in 2025. I think this may be an anomaly, but it's certainly different from the rest of the country and what they're seeing happen. So we tend to be about five years behind the rest of the country on everything. <laughs> That's true. That's true. And so right now, everything's pretty good and groovy. Hmm. I think it leaves some space for us to learn from what other people are doing and maybe avoid some of the pitfalls. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, if you're five years behind, you're, you might be five years behind a lot of mistakes, too. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then there is the overarching question I always get of cannabis. What is cannabis doing mm. to the industry? Mm. Young people are drinking less. This is true. Have they traded to cannabis? I can only speak for my two children, and yes. <laughs> uh, they are 21 and 23, and although they've both worked at breweries and one still does, um, their focus is on community 
and like hanging out. But the biggest threat that can- cannabis has for the overall hospitality industry is that in order to use those products you pick up at a dispensary, which another side note, you have to go through like security to get in. A lot of people avoid it just for that reason. Mm. I don't recommend that. I think you should give it a shot. But that's me. On the grid, man. You don't want to be on the <laughs> yeah. grid. Yeah. This is recorded. No, I'm just I know. <laughs> gotcha. But, Bring them in, boys. <laughs> but the bigger thing is that you have to use it in your home. So you're not going mm. out as much simply for the fact that you say, hey, I'm going to do this today. So trying to work around that, work with that, find ways to potentially um, hemp-based THC is something that's blowing up in Minnesota and Illinois and some other states where craft beer breweries are making hemp-based THC products wow. and they're bringing not, it more into the mainstream and They're not retail. intersecting the two. It's not You can't have alcohol and THC yeah, together, but yeah. you could make them as two separate products and Within have them the available. Brewery. Yeah. Yeah, and and if those if that goes into the standard restaurant bar retail space I think it just leaves more opportunities for people to, hey, I want I don't really want to drink. There's a lot of people that don't drink, but they will do they will use cannabis to bring them back out and get them socializing more in our spaces. Interesting. So it's it's and again, that's bringing a whole new bunch of challenges to the guild and how we work through that. Interesting. I don't worry about the younger generation drinking too much cuz craft beer is kind of it's an evolution as you're drinking, right? Most people don't come out of the gates and like, oh, I'm going to crush IPAs. Like they usually start with the light beers and then you kind of, if they're into it, they start graduating up. Yeah. So I think it's more the the demographic of 25 to 30 that we kind of want to capture. Um, and hopefully we hold that demographic through their whole life cycle. Yeah. So. Yeah. Their, their drinking journey. <laughs> their drinking yeah. journey. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, craft beer didn't really exist when... I was a kid, so I mean, out here, yeah, yeah, here at least, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and craft beer really, one of the essences of craft is innovation and flavor. So we've gotten a lot of people saying, "Oh, that craft beer that that brings a lot of flavor and new stuff to me all the time," and they're finding that in alternative beverage, adult beverage products too. Mm. So we can't just say, "Okay, we've done everything. Let's just keep doing the same thing we're doing," and RTDs are doing that in wine, like beatbox. Come on. They're like yeah. huge. And why is that? Because flavors, like you're mm. not just drinking a box of wine, you're drinking fruity wines and punches and all kinds of stuff. And fireball made by <laughs> <laughs> is fireball still around. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's around, maybe. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> Sticky. Oh, so um, <laughs> us continuing to innovate is really the key to yeah. Yeah. Uh, craft beer maintaining where we're at. Sure. So I guess a question for the group in general is kind of um, where do you where do you see uh, the breweries um, engaging with, I guess, those changes in the markets? Like, are you doing anything specific? Are you leaning into certain beers and then testing out things in the background um, to see how they do at the same time. How does that work for wilderness? Uh, we're always trying new things, trying to try new beers while still keeping our, our core stuff going on. Um, and that's kind of for a brewer. And that's my perspective. That's, that's natural. Mm-hmm. Like it's hard for me to like, Oh, this beer is doing really well, but it'll be a little bit better if I dry hopped it this much more. Yeah. Um, so like I'm always uh, trying to innovate and create the next new thing while still holding to what we've always done. Yeah. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, we're all, um, on top of, and even with the guild's help is what the trends are. Um, they might start on another side of the country. And again, we're about five years behind, but we do take notice and we do see where, you know, trends are. And being out here, uh, you talk to people who are from, you know, Oregon or whatever, like just, our beers hit different in Arizona. You know, I mean, we have the sun all day, every day for the most part. And, you know, we have different styles, different beers, like, you know, sour beers out here are a lot more popular than they are in other parts of the country because it's a little bit crisper. It's a little bit, you know, has that tartness, stuff like that. So we are looking into those, um, you know, ABV is always a game where it's like, how, how strong do we make it? How light do we make it? You know, it's like, oh, it's 3%. Then people are like, why am I even drinking beer? You know, I mean, okay, Mm -hmm. fine. That's fine. 
you know, so there's just a lot of, you know, back and forth internally on where we want to land, but we are definitely always seeking, you know, like non-alcoholic beer, what a waste of a tap line. Well, okay. There's some benefits. Oh, okay. It's growing, you know, and then it just kind of, you know, snowballs from there and yeah, see it. And I don't think it's a bad thing that Arizona in craft beers behind, mm. you know, five to six years. Cause in Oregon, like it, Portland is entrenched. Like they have a craft beer community that's decades old. So it's hard for a new place to come in. Yeah. It's hard for stuff to really change. Wisconsin's like the same way. California's the same way. So we kind of we're kind of developing that community as we go. And it's a transplant state, right? So like we're getting that all those things from different places. Yeah, so. for sure. That's why I tell everybody about Arizona doing business in Arizona in general when they ask. It's like I feel compared to those other cities there's like less rings to kiss and like mm-hmm. red tape to jump through to like get something started it's pretty easy to tap in you can be tap in nice two <laughs> there you go <laughs> <laughs> you can be two to three people away from the person you need to get to pretty quickly if you want to like get something started so i totally agree yeah that's cool yeah uh question back to the like potential of breweries closing and then i don't know how many years uh, has anyone, is there conversation at all regarding uh, what Barrio Brewing has done and transitioned to becoming employee owned? Is that something of conversation at all? It's not a trend we see in a big way right now. Okay. What they did was amazing. I don't really see, and they had been around for f- at least 15, maybe 25 years before they actually made that move. Yeah. So we're not really there yet. Um, you know, like back in the day, New Belgium did that. Yeah. Right. So they're definitely going to be a larger brewery with a lot more already existing capital investments that are rolling over. A lot of our breweries are just not that. Yeah. That makes sense. Modern Modern Times did it too. And that was kind of the start of them going bankrupt. Oh, really? (laughs) Yeah. Interesting. (laughs) Other reasons. Other reasons. But yeah, that was a... Bad moves all over. <laughs> well, cool. Well, the last thing I wanted to talk about is I know that all of you have been involved in the Arizona Fall Festival for years and years and years. We're coming back November 9th uh, this year at Hans Park. Uh, we just love having uh, the brewery community come out. It's so fun. Um, wanted to just get your perspectives, why you love coming out every year, um, why it's a meaningful thing to you. Like I was saying before the show, that you have so many options, you get so many requests to participate in things, and it takes your time and your staff to invest in being there that day. Any, anything to share about that? I'll go, because I love it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, one, I'm always about $100 deep when I like see the Zia tent, because I'm always <laughs> up in there buying some records. But, uh, I mean, you honestly, I mean, we try – even as, you know, we do other beer festivals just to keep it, you know, local and, you know, in itself. But like what you guys have done year in and year out, even, you know, when we were well, one brewery, we would show up. But it's the amount of people that come out, the support you have for each other, the connections we make on not a customer level, but other vendors out there that are, you know, interested or, you know, we have collaborative ideas on how to how to use that. Um because we're there hours before the general public. So we all sit around and talk and, you know, and kind of network that way. But um, just to highlight what Arizona's doing, like, you know, I, this is a botched story, but, you know, somebody coming out from San Diego would be like, oh, you know what Arizona needs is good pizza. It's like, well, <laughs> hold on a minute. Yeah, it's a, have you heard, ever heard of Pizzeria Bianco yeah, before? They, they you just know? got ranked like best pizza in the world. Yeah. Too. yeah. You know, and it's like, <laughs> People think that we need stuff, um, mm-hmm. and that's you know that's fair. They think it's wild west out here, like you're saying. Sometimes it's not so hard to get things done, but we're actually like we talk a lot. You know, we're not like hey, welcome. You know, like we might be a little like hard up front kind of thing, but like we know what's going on. We're very receptive to small business uh, getting going. But uh, my experiences with going to that is, you know, just to see everybody there to support local and to thrive and to see. The community because you have you know your downtown kind of vibes you have your east valley whatever it might be like it's it's all over um you know the state to represent like what's you know small business can do and and specifically for the breweries to highlight them and to have a band and to have like this you know relaxation area and downtown so hopefully it's easier for everyone to get down to um i mean it's a day out in the sun that's you know usually pretty not hot you know it's just the weather's nice I mean, it's one of the best festivals I go to where I can see the growth of what Arizona's doing because I I can't 
possibly keep up with all of it. But when I show up there, I get a better, you know, finger on the pulse on, you know, where we're at and what, you know, what's going on. That's really rad. Love it. I don't think anybody can top that. So <laughs> I, I've never been. This is my, uh, this is my second year in okay. uh, Arizona. So oh, I'll, right I'll have to make it out. Okay, cool. We are going to have a guild booth there this year for the first time. Heck yeah. So I'm pretty stoked to be yeah. part of it, especially after hearing what <laughs> Kayla had to say. Like, now I'm like, oh, this is going to be super cool. <laughs> right on, right on. Well, uh, thank you guys for being here today. This is awesome. Um, hope if you're listening that you go visit Oso, you go visit AZ Wilderness, and you check out the 107 yeah, Unique today. craft breweries <laughs> in Arizona or one of the 100 and many locations. Right. And just uh, always remember to, to um, reach out and connect with your uh, local businesses in your neighborhood. So appreciate everything Craft Brewers Guild does and all you guys do for the community. Thanks so much for being here. Anything to, to leave the listeners with? Well, I remember the first time when I was working at Perch. So two things. One, I was at the Perch for my first brewing job, and I knew that we had a 300-seat restaurant. Not everyone's drinking beer. So we wanted to make sure that cocktail drinkers and wine drinkers got an opportunity to try some beer that they never would think was beer. So that was why sours were a big thing when I was working there, so that we could bring cocktail drinkers into the beer fold. Mm -hmm. Something that I always thought about. And then my first time that I ever kegged up a beer, I had been learning from podcasts and watching <laughs> videos and never worked in a brewery before. So my beer is ready to go. It's in the bright tank. It's carved. And I thought, how do I put it in a keg? <laughs> There's not a lot of videos and podcasts about how to put beer in a keg. Yeah. So I called up John at Wilderness and I said, John, I have this beer ready, but I don't know how to get it out. <laughs> and he just said, hold on, I'll come right over. So he jumped in his car and zipped down and helped me keg up my first beer. So I thought that was a great story about how the community works together. Love it. Love well, it. and to go with that, John helping you out, uh, when Wilderness was opening their doors, they were kind of getting low on, on their finances and also actually helped them with their first order of grain. Oh, wow. So that they could start producing beer. So that's cool. Nice. It's just very serendipitous that, you know, this is a culture that we create is helping each other. You know, we're not against each other. We want more and we, you know, more neighbors, more brothers, sisters in the communities. Pretty rad. So, yeah. Love it. Cool. Well, we hope everyone listening was inspired today, listening to our business community, working to leave a legacy in Arizona through doing great business. I want to thank our sponsor, Phoenix Business Radio X, for always hosting us and for all of our partners, including the Arizona Craft Brewers Guild. This is Thomas Barr from Local First reminding you that if we want to build a better Arizona, we need to connect deeply with the local businesses that make us proud to call this place home. Thank you for listening to Arizona Good Business Radio with Local First Arizona, where entrepreneurs and local businesses come together to build stronger communities. We hope your business is inspired to take part in building a better Arizona. 